best way of saving people was to strap them in to the vehicle that they were in uh, so that they'd be protected by the structure in the event of an accident. And this, this went through, the car makers picked it up, particularly in America uh, in the years between the two wars. But the problem is that when you, when you have an accident in, the, in a car or an airplane, the G-forces are, are very, very high, the deceleration. And of course, the people weigh quite a lot, have quite a considerable mass. So of course, when the vehicle stops, the, um, under Newton's law, the person tries to keep going forwards, and that's what causes the damage. Now, <clears throat> the, the weight of a person is such that in the event of an accident, which could easily reach sort of NG, something like that, um, the, the force that that person is exerting upon or needs to have exerted on him, him to stop him moving is thousand is a ton or so, you know, it's it's significant figures. So if you tie the person into a vehicle and the attachment point isn't strong enough, the whole system is useless. Anyway, consequently, some car makers, particularly Americans, I think it was the Nash Corporation, um, attempted to fit seat belts to the more expensive models. And of course, they had to design the car structure to be strong enough to do it. So, okay. Campaigners started campaigning uh, after the Second World War um, for seat belts in cars. Um, the aircraft industry had developed full harnesses, which held you to a seat which was stressed in with the aircraft. <clears throat> and, and, you know, that was fine, but very complicated. And the other trouble was that Cars were different car makers, had different design philosophies. And the whole thing was transformed, really, when Volvo, who actually started seatbelts in the 1950s, um, had a very bright engineer called Nils Bolin. Because up to then, seatbelts, the easy ones, were just a, a, a lap strap a strap going from effectively the transmission tunnel in the vehicle across your middle and down to the floor again. But the trouble is, um, you could still crash forward and bang your head through the windscreen or you impale yourself on the steering column. Um, and they, they did a bit of good, but not much. And Nils Olin came up with this brilliant idea, which you'll identify, of the three-point seat belt where you hook on to the top of the door pillar, the bottom of the door pillar, and effectively the transmission tunnel. And it's just one piece of webbing with a buckle that slides on it, plugs in. It, it's just so, such a classic piece of simple design. And of course, it restrains the, the belly, which is vulnerable, um, shares the load with your chest, which is reasonably strong, um, and is cheap and simple. And Volvo patented this, and to their eternal credit, they freed the patent of all royalty rights. So that anybody in the world was free to use it without paying them a license or anything. And I think that's one of the most generous things any manufacturer has ever done. Because after all, they could have just kept it. They could have tied it up with a very rigid patent, and you'd have only got it on the Volvo. So there we are. Now, because that became practical, and because all cars ceased to be wooden bodies built on a steel chassis, and they went to steel on a car construction, all cars started to have a very similar body structure. And it became practical for government to say, we are going to make the installation facility for seat belts compulsory on all cars. And this was coming in in the late 1950s. So that was fine. Now, there was a terrific opposition to seatbelts. I mean, it sounds crazy these days, doesn't it? But there was a lot of opposition. Um, one of the main objectors were pregnant women. Um, 
people who suffered from claustrophobia, and they said, we don't like to be strapped into a car. We want to feel free to move, okay? And there was this enormous opposition. There wasn't so much opposition to making seat point uh, attachment points compulsory. You know, that, that was fairly cheap for manufacturers to do. Uh, but the actual thought of wearing them uh, was abhorrent to quite a lot of people. Now, <clears throat> the aircraft industry has been happening along with, of course, a lot more money to spare. And for example, commercial airlines, if you can think of an airline pilot, you see pictures of his control and he's, he's got to be, you know, he's got a huge office in which he's got to be free to work. And he, whereas a fighter pilot could be strapped in while he does aerobatics and all the rest of it, because he's, everything is like a, you know, very close to him, the airline crew, the, the pilot and co-pilot had to be free to move. So they invented a thing called the inertia reel. And I, I'm gonna get horribly technical here, um, but the idea is if, if the webbing to which your belt is attached uh, is rolled up on a drum, okay? And if you pull the webbing out quickly with an acceleration, that is transferred to an acceleration on the spindle that the belt is wrapped around. Now, what they did was they put, and I'm sorry I haven't got beautiful drawings or pictures of this, but if you imagine a loose flywheel, a disc, a heavy disc, which is on this shaft, but is not rigidly attached to it. If you just jolt, jolt the belt, because of its inertia, that flywheel will stay still. Not we so far. If in fact it isn't loose on, on, on the shaft, but is on a thread, then if you jerk the belt, because the flywheel doesn't want to go round, it will move that way. Okay? And if it moves that way and it's got teeth on the end and you've got some teeth there, it'll stop the belt. So the inertia of the flywheel translates the belt movement that way to a locking movement that way. Okay? So the immediate thing was that all the people in this country who wanted to get contracts to put seat belts in cars with the car makers decided that they got to have a piece of this action, but it was very heavily patented. And the car makers were going to seatbelt makers and said, look, when this becomes compulsory, if you want our contract for seatbelts, you've got to be able to offer a retractable seatbelt as well. All right. Now, I work for a small firm, they're quite famous, they're called Norris Brothers, and their claim to fame was designing Campbell's Blue Bird car and boat. And I was working for them as a development engineer, which meant I got all the old jobs, which involved thinking about things, making prototypes, and working models. Okay. And we were confronted by three very rude gentlemen uh, from a firm called Britax. And you probably all know Britax because they're still in business making child seats but it was the Proctor family, Father Proctor and his two large sons, who descended upon the Norris brothers, who immediately pulled me in. And he said, we've got to have something. We want the British Leyland, or was it British Leyland, or BMC, whatever it was, contract. And we've got to have a retractable boat, belt. And we've had an idea. And their idea was not to have a flywheel walking down on a thread, it was to have little teeth attached and hinged to the drum on which the belt was, that if you pull the belt out quickly, the teeth flew out and engaged in, in the locking rim. Okay? So in other words, it was a totally different principle. And they said, this is the way. They got a little model of this work. It wasn't a full working model. Um, and they said, in addition, we want this to have a, a, a knob on the end of it, so that it's got three positions. Yes, says John, this thing very, very carefully. Um, we want you to do it so that in one position, it's always locked. In one position, it's automatic. And for some unknown reason, the third position, it doesn't do anything. It's just completely free. 
okay, can you please turn this idea into some demonstrable prototypes? Don't worry about production or anything else. We want some decent looking prototypes that we can take to the car manufacturers and say, this is what we're working on. So my governors turned to me and said, okay, John, how much? I said, to do the necessary designing, not for a production thing, but to design working prototypes and produce you two fully finished models, 250 quid. It's quite a lot of money in those days. This is in 1963, it got to me, this, this project. Oh, they said, well, we want it in a fortnight because we want to demonstrate it at the motor industry research base. So anyway, we did it. Beautifully looking thing, absolutely marvellous. Um, I, I had working for me a very nice young machinist and a sheet metal worker, and we drew it and fiddled around, and we made it up, and it worked. What you didn't see was that we hadn't had time to make a proper string, spring to go inside it, so there was an elastic band <laughs> that retracted the belt, and it was generally complete bodge inside, but it looked quite good outside. Okay, so the Britax, the Proctor family paid their money and went off. And that was the end of the story, as far as my firm was concerned. Now, every month, because I was doing these ridiculous things and quoting prices and, you know, sticking your neck out on everything, um, we used to have a meeting to discuss how various jobs are done. And I was talking to um, Ken and Lou Morris. And they said, that was a good job. John, you know, we made a good profit on that. Must have made about 10 quid, I think. And I said, well, there's something wrong with it. And they said, what do you mean? It, you know, it needs production design, which hopefully we might get the job of doing. Um, but, but, you know, what's wrong? I said, I don't know. But I said, I'll tell you this, I wouldn't put one in my car. They, they looked at me and said, oh, don't be daft, anyway. And I said, well, I'm going to think about it. So they said, oh, well, tell us if you get any ideas. And I think Jill and I took the kids down, we had one, one child then, down to the beach one day from where we were living in Hayward Seath. And I suddenly said to Jill, that BB seatbelt, there, there's something wrong with it. And she said, well, what is it? And I said, well, if you think about it, the aircraft one, the Teleflex one, you've got to put a sufficient acceleration onto the webbing because it's an inertia thing. With the Britex one, it's rather different. You've got to apply a certain velocity to the belt because it's centrifugal force. Okay. And the trouble is, if you see an accident happening, you know, in other words, you're going down the road, there's a crash inevitable. What's your instinct? Anybody wish to unmute and make a comment? But the immediate reaction is you brace yourself back in the seat, don't you? The more you brace yourself, the less likely the damn seat belt is going to lock. So, you know, the principle is wrong. Okay. I went back to my home workshop in the basement at home because this wasn't a, a paid for job. And I came up with, hang on, this, beautiful, isn't it? Now, this, I screwed on the wooden floor in the back of the van that I was running as my private vehicle. And it's very difficult to see, but it's got a, a proper spring, uh, it's got a webbing belt, and on the left-hand side, you can see that there's a catch and a tooth ring. And hanging in the middle is a weight suspended between two bits of fishing line. Now, the interesting thing is, whichever way that weight goes in, in a horizontal plane, whichever way that weight goes, it will put the tooth, the, the sprag, into the tooth wheel and lock the belt. So the key difference is, that the other two systems worked on the belt unraveling. 
This doesn't give a damn what the belt's doing. It depends on what the car is doing. So if the car accelerates or is hit violently in any direction, or if it tips, if it rolls over, if it falls down a precipice, that little weight will trip the lock on the belt almost instantly. So anyway, I went trundling back to the Norris Brothers and said, Oi, Kevin Lou, come down to the car park and, and sit in my van. And all we did was we literally held the webbing across our bodies, sat in the seat uh, and kept tugging on the belt. And even in the car park at about, you know, banging the brakes on two or three miles an hour, the belt would lock every time. And they said, bloody hell, or words to that effect. Okay, end of story. The next thing was there was an open day at Road Research where all the car makers were demonstrating their attempts to solve the seatbelt problem. The Road Research Laboratory was up at Hendon, I think, on an old airfield. And I, I went up in my van, not, not as a contributor, but I went up to have a look and see what people were doing. And I got talking to a nice old gentleman, um, obviously scientific, who introduced himself. He was actually the director of the Road Research Laboratory. And I looked, looking at all these models that were displayed, I said, you know, they're all wrong. He said, what do you mean, young man? And I said, well, you know, it's the wrong principle. I said, um, do, do you want to see how one could properly work? And he said, yes. I said, well, I've got one in the car park. And there it was, <laughs> this, this thing that you can see before me. And I had done a form of belt so that it went over his shoulder and down to the transmission tunnel. And I'm a little Ford Anglia van. And he said, well, take me out to the runway. Now, out on the runway, there were Leyland cars and Hillman cars and God knows what, tearing up and down, jamming their brakes on, showing how good their seat belts were. So anyway, we bundled out around the sort of approach lanes to the, to the um, runway. And we were doing about three miles an hour. And he was leaning forward, said so his head was just near the dashboard and come. Oh, he said, it works very, very nice. Oh, he said, I can move quite freely. So I waited till he was about six inches over the dashboard, went bonk on the brakes. And it worked, thank God. And he turned around and forget, forget, forgive me, ladies, for my language. I'm only quoting a very distinguished man. And he said, you cheeky, cheeky young bugger. So, End of story. Norris's did the right thing. They went back to Britax and said, by the way, we think we've got a better way of doing the job. And Britax said, go and boil your heads. You're just trying to get more work out of us. So they went to a firm called Irvin Airshoot. And Irvin took this on board. First of all, I, I did a better, pro better prototype. Here we are. This is Mark II, and you can see a proper little pendulum hanging there, and everything was counterweighted, done properly, and it worked quite nicely, right? So it went to the Irving Airshoot Company, and there is one that our design department had taken this upon themselves to improve. Two pictures of the Irving Norris Dynalog. Now, I left the firm soon afterwards. I in honour them to try and patent the thing, uh, but they th it was too expensive. I think it cost 50 quid to file a provisional patent. And of course, the thing was, the principle was unique because it was, it was sensing vehicle movement and not passenger movement relative to the vehicle. So that's where I left it. I, I faded out after that. The interesting thing is that you've all all of those of you who've got cars or going cars will actually use one of these. It's not quite the same because the one thing, this to my mind, gave safety in the best possible way because it was looking at if anything was untoward with the vehicle, then you were stabilized in the vehicle. The other systems, I don't think you had to be moving in your seat. You had to be taking off. The act was started before anything happened. 
One advantage of the belt sensing system was you could see whether it was working, because when you got in the car, you could give it a tug and you'd lock the belt. This one, you could tug it to your heart's content and absolutely nothing would happen. It was quite free and free to move. And the interesting thing is that all the modern stuff now combine the two. They've got an inertia grip, they've got, they've got the uh, vehicle sensing system all based on a form of pendulum, although some of them might use electronic accelerometers now. And they also have the, the belt thing so that you can jerk it and reassure yourself that it's working, which of course it isn't necessarily doing the job properly. So that, that was the way we went. Um, I, I had no further business with it at all. It was quite a long time before we actually had a car with seat belts. Um, but it does intrigue me because at the moment, if you look up Norris Brothers and all sorts of things, it gives them credit uh, for inventing the pendulum device. The interesting thing was that another company did an alternative pendulum, which was a ball uh, rocking around, it, it, uh, a ball ro rolling around in a ball, wherever it rolled, it lifted a flapper, in, uh, which is effectively just a pendulum anyway. Uh, and that was patented a week before the Norris brothers finally filed a patent on this. So, of course, they didn't get it because it was time out. So they couldn't have made a fortune out of it. I wouldn't have ever got anything. I was quite happy. I'd had a very interesting job. And um, my hunch, I think, had been proved right. So that was my very small transient contribution to road safety. End of story. That was wonderful. Thank you ever so much, uh, John. I, 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 I've <laughs> you said this is rather boring. Uh, well, it's it's not. <laughs> and, uh, uh, we take all these things for granted, don't we? Um, yeah. To actually speak to, in effect, the inventor of something that's transformed our lives is a yeah. privilege, a real privilege, John. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, it, we do take things for granted. I, yeah. I remember the very first car that we had was was just a strap, and you had to adjust it, didn't you? Every time, that's and right. if it's a different drive, you had to uh, had to adjust yeah. it. And then when, and I think it was called the inertial reel, it was probably before the sophistication of what you talked about came in, like the novelty of when you move forward, it locking was was quite remarkable. Um, yeah. But now, of course, and I think it, down to the genius of your, your work, um, yeah. it, it's something which is much... <laughs> It's a very elaborate uh, piece of kit, isn't it? And mm. it has to be, and this is the crucial thing, 100% reliable. Yeah. And that's what the challenge is, isn't it? As you say, and I I hadn't realised that you needed to factor in both, the, obviously, the passenger movement, but the vehicle movement, because if you think of the physics of it, you, you need both, as you said. It's yeah. simple and obvious, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think the trouble is, because of the success of the aircraft thing, everybody was focused on trying to compete with that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Go back to basics. And that, that was what was somehow bugging me. The thing is, I, I didn't design the damn things. I'm, 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 I was never a production engineer. Um, I, I, I used to get bored. I had this marvellous job with Norris for three years. Where we could literally take on any problem that was thrown at us price and solve it. I mean, it was, I mean it, it, this was just one, one thing. I mean, we did um, inflatable buildings, which were coming in at the time. Oh, methane storage tanks for ships. Um, <laughs> wipers for cars. I, I mean, it's, a, it's a sort of an inventor's paradise, really, isn't it? <laughs> I have about 60 stories, of which this is just one. I mean, I was, oh, well. <laughs> my, my whole career, or most of my career, was spent in relatively small firms um, doing 
Peace Robinson type work. How fascinating. How fascinating. Yeah. Well, let's, um, I, I'm sure others have got uh, questions. I've got to remove the spotlight. Um, and uh, if you click on gallery view, everyone, we should be back to normal. Uh, so we can see everyone on the call. Um, yeah. So any, any questions, anyone, from, uh, from, from well, what was a, a fascinating uh, account? Uh, Marjorie? Well, a very simple question, really. Why in places like the aeroplane do we only have one that goes across our tummy, whereas in cars and, and buses we have them going across the chest? Is that to do with speed? or? I, I don't honestly know. I think the problem is... Um, in aircraft, I'm, I'm just trying to think of it, you've got a gang of seats. Now, it would be quite easy for the one nearest the outside of the plane to have a proper belt attachment. But the trouble is, you, you've got to stress, the only other place you can attach is, is the top of the seat. Mm -hmm. really, your diagonal thing has got to go to something. Yeah. Oh. Anything you could anchor it to would be the top of the seat, which means that all the seats have got to be stressed to take the, the force of that weight. The, the lap belt, of course, is down on the part of the seat that is fixed to the front of the aircraft. Mm. Because the seats recline, you, 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 yeah. you, you, everything would have to get too heavy. I think this is the problem in aircraft, mm. your balancing. The, the other thing, quite honestly, is what do they tell you to do in an aircraft emergency you know is happening? You get warning. What do, what do they all say? Put your head down. Mm. Why? Because right. if your head down is touching the seat in front, you can bang into it. Yeah. So in other words, yeah. the safest thing is for you to be up against it. Mm. I, I oh, think that's interesting. That, that, yeah, that is interesting, isn't it? So there isn't the the jolt, there isn't the impact, is there? Because you're already connected to it. Well, the, yeah. the impact the impact is there, um, but the the load is taken on the, the force. Yeah, on, yeah, on your body. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, fascinating. Yes, I noticed. Um, Bob and I do a bit of coach travelling, and coaches are the same. They've just got the laptop. Um, yeah. belts which uh, do the trick I think because it does restrain you um, yeah. uh, and of course you are then in, in sequence you, you, you can't go very far no no that's right exactly, exactly. And, and all you're going on is the back of a seat yes that's right yeah not going yeah. on to steering wheels or wind no the stuff that could cut in or yeah do do yeah. all this damage yeah, um, yeah. Next, ne next time I go on a National Express bus I shall check this out but Actually, you're wrong, John. I mean, not I'm not necessarily wrong in the coach you were, but on a National Express bus, the belt definitely comes across. Yeah. Oh, does it? Does yeah. it? And, and yeah. also the seat next to you does that. And that's what I shall look at, John, see how it's kind of anchored. Uh, it probably depends on the coach manufacturer then. That's interesting. Yeah. 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 But of course, what I don't know on an aircraft, where there are, you're sitting in a bench, like you say, with three seats, I don't, where there are obviously all just around the, the, the waist. I don't know whether that would be possible, you know, to anchor it for the reasons that you're saying, John. Old oh, John, I'm talking to. <laughs> I'll have to change my name. <laughs> uh, and I think, uh, well, it's actually good when you're in a small size because you've got bracket after that, um, that Zoom pudding. It's saying OJ. So you're OJ, really. <laughs> But um, no, I was saying on an aeroplane, um, you're quite right, aren't you? you? You know, in in the sort, probably in the circumstances where you're going to have your life safe, you would be warned exactly like you say. Yes, 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 yeah. One query that fascinated me, uh, I remember having a conversation with a friend about this at the time. Um, I, I'd, I'd learned to drive and seatbelts were brought in shortly after. And it was a bit sort of fiddly, wasn't it? You had to, as I said earlier, you've got to adjust it. But I remember saying, oh, you feel safer, and therefore, is there a tendency to drive faster? Mm. So it gives you a sort of false sense of security. I remember having quite a, a discussion with a friend about that at that time. Obviously, now it's second nature, you just get very used to it. But I'm just wondering if that was an effect or whether that was just me and my friend. 
I think that was a story was very commonly sold. by those that didn't want to wear seatbelts. Yeah. Mm. Yes, yeah. yes, it's a, a counter-argument. Yeah, the occasional, oh, if I had been wearing a seatbelt, I would have been killed. Yeah. This is sort of one car accident in a thousand where a seatbelt would have been harmful. But having been involved in motorway maintenance for a good few years and seen a tremendous number of wrecks, the vast, you know, seatbelts were the lifesaver and still are. Oh, absolutely. I, uh, interesting, I used to work at Harefield Hospital, um, and that is, I think still is, uh, the UK, Europe, uh, number one centre for heart transplants. And one of the problems, as you know, is trying to um, um, identify organs for recipients. And the seatbelt uh, policy was... Uh in a very curious way, it was a sort of godsend for that. Um, <laughs> uh, well, it depends on your point of view, really, but uh, that could have an effect in terms of uh, preserving the organ. Um, but uh, I, I was quite interested in, in, in the impact that that could, uh, could have in a rather indirect way. I think, actually, the, the free-running reel, which you've got, I mean, fairly free-running reel, um, doesn't give you that full sense of security. It is yeah. strapped in that, that, that makes you feel a bit cocky about things and, you know, I, I'm safe, I can do whatever I yeah. want. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. No, it's an interesting effect psychologically. Any, any other questions, anyone? I just think it's not a question, really, but I think it would be interesting if Dragon's Den was around in your day, John, um, John <laughs> Because you could live on Exmouth Marine then. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what I thought. It's a shame, really, that you weren't identified in some way. Because if, yeah. if you say you can look up your foot firm and, and see it's attributed to it, it's a shame that actually your name isn't linked to it as well in, say, Wikipedia or whatever it is. But um, think, yeah. there you go. But actually, um, John, I, I really, oh, John, I, I really, really enjoyed your talk. This yeah, yeah, me too. It, yeah, it, yeah, it was yeah. very interesting, really. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, let's give you a good round of applause. Yeah. Thank you, and, and thank you very, very much. It's, uh,